bit test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear some people talking about getting exercise. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 and 2. Hey, Janos, have you seen this notice here? What's that? Join our mall walking programme, Get Fit, for free. Now, I like the sound of that. I can't afford to keep up my gym membership this term. It's too expensive. Mm, I know what you mean. But what exactly is mall walking? Sounds a bit boring to me. Hold on. OK, it may sound boring, but it might be a great opportunity to take exercise. Hmm. Think about it. A climate-controlled environment where you can take exercise without having to worry about the wind or the rain. Wind and rain? <laughs> Have you actually looked at the weather outside? It's snow and ice out there. I only came into the mall to keep warm. Well, it is winter and we are in Canada after all. Mm. So just think, by mall walking we can exercise indoors instead of outdoors. Great. And another thing, we won't have to worry about the traffic. Just think, no busy roads to cross and no rush hours to think about. Come on, it's worth a try. Mm. You're still not exactly selling it to me. Imagine walking past the same stores, and they're not even open. So what's the point of that? Oh, come on, Janos. Just think about it as an opportunity to window shop and keep an eye out for bargains. Mm. And what about all the amazing decorations and displays we can take a look at? I think it sounds like fun. <laughs> Did you say fun? <laughs> walking on a hard surface like concrete. Give me grass any day. Much more comfortable on the feet. And there's another thing. In a mall, you're always close to restrooms. And water come to that. What could be better than that? I think I know the answer to that one. Exercising in a gym is a whole lot better. Well, anyway, we can get more details I'd of the like information I'd like more information here. about the mall So do you want to come program. with me or not? Great. Uh, We're always I'll looking for new members. I'm off to the gym to make the most of my membership the before it runs oh, out. <laughs> uh, on the notice board on the first floor. Oh, that's great. Most of our new members come through the website or through friends. Good to know people still read the notice board here in the mall. Yes, I guess so. Now, let me give you some details. The programme runs weekdays, Monday through Friday. And it's an early start. Wait for it. Walkers meet at 7am. 7am? That is pretty early. But come to think of it, my lectures start at 9 most mornings, so I would be able to make it back to the campus in plenty of time. Great. Actually, most members go straight on to work or college after their walk, so you're not alone. Now, our members meet here on the ground floor... Here at the information kiosk? No, just over there at the food court. Oh, the food court. OK. Yes, just follow the smell of coffee. Normally about 10 to 15 people show up for each walk, but numbers can vary. So up to 15 in a group. That's an ideal number. Glad it's not 50. <laughs> and how long do the walks last? You can expect to walk for one hour, but some groups do less. Half an hour or so, and a few groups even do up to an hour and a half, so it's best to check when you arrive. Which day were you thinking of starting? Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, next Monday would work for me. Morning lectures have been cancelled, so I would have plenty of time. Monday the 4th of February? Yes, that's right. OK. So let's get your details. Can you give me your full name? Anya Karchevskaya. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes. K A R C H E V S K A Y A. And your address? Apartment 12, 2 Burlington Street. And a contact telephone number? 0757 634 5003. I'll just read that back. 0757 634 5003. Yes. Oh, by the way, new members receive a free gift when they join, and it's a much better gift than last year. We gave people badges, but they tended to lose them, and more recently we provided visors instead, but they weren't very popular. So this year we're giving new members t shirts. That's great. What colour? Yellow. I've got plenty in stock, so you can collect yours on Monday. Thanks a lot. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guide talking about a tourist program. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to all of you. Can everyone see me and hear me? Good. My name's Cathy and I'm here to tell you about the special programme of events going on here at the Royal Observatory. Yes, it's Doors Open Day here in Edinburgh. And we're delighted that you have chosen to make this very special building part of your own Open Doors Day experience. Now, I'll make a start with giving you some background information about the Doors Open event. Doors Open takes place every year in September and the observatory is one of the many buildings, 112 of them in fact, that open their doors to visitors for one weekend. And yes, there's absolutely no charge. It's all completely free. The observatory has been involved in this event for more than 20 years. And every year, we attract more and more visitors, like you, who want to find out more about great buildings in the city. And hopefully, you'll leave with a better understanding of the universe too. OK, now let's run through today's programme of events. There are many activities to choose from, so make sure you make the most of your visit. Now, there will be planetarium shows throughout the day. Now, these will run four times, both today and tomorrow, Sunday. These are popular, so please note that we're operating a booking system for these shows. Tickets for the two shows we're running this morning, the first showing at 10.30 and the second, at 11.30, will be available on a first-come, first-served basis, here at the information point. Tickets for the two afternoon shows at 2pm and then at 3pm will be released later on at midday, 
So booking is essential as spaces go very quickly. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. We also have some special tours of the observatory available. These include a tour of the telescope dome and visitors will even have the opportunity to get onto the roof. I hope that those of you who are interested are wearing your most comfortable shoes and that you can keep up the pace. It will be worth the effort of climbing all these stairs. You'll have stunning views over the city when you reach the top. Now, for those of you who want to take things at a more leisurely pace, there will be an opportunity to visit the Crawford Collection and learn about the instruments that have been built here and there will also be some items from the collection on view. For those of you who don't already know, the Crawford Collection is an astronomical library. And not only that, it ranks as one of the most important astronomical libraries in the world. You are promised a real treat here. And it's great to have so many younger visitors here today. Now, we have a craft workshop for children here in the visitor centre where they can make their very own model of a telescope and colour their very own planet. Please note that all children must be accompanied by an adult. So. As you can see, it's a pretty full timetable and there's a lot going on. Now, any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor giving advice to a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 28. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 28. Hi, Leo. What is it you wanted to ask me about? I'm worried about the exams. I don't mean if I pass them or not. I mean about revising. I don't think I know how to revise. I mean, every time I start looking back over my work, I just switch off. I can't concentrate. I don't think you're the first student that ever said that, Leo. Mm. Are you revising at the right time? I mean, are you leaving it until too late at night when you've got no energy left? It's hard to achieve anything when you're exhausted. No, not really. It doesn't seem to make any difference what time it is. Mm. Well, are you worrying too much about the subjects you feel you're not very good at? I mean, are you revising only what you find difficult? Hmm, I guess I am doing that. Isn't that the best approach to revision? Not necessarily. I'd say it's better to revise something you enjoy and something you feel confident about first. Hmm. That'll get you into the swing of things, and then you can go on to more challenging things. Anyway, you have to think about the whole purpose of revision. Is the objective to do as well as you possibly can in your strong subjects or to bring your weaker subjects up to an acceptable level. 
I'm not sure I see the point of revising what I think I'll pass anyway. Uh, but revising a stronger subject might mean getting an A grade rather than a B.、Mm. That might be more rewarding and beneficial in the long run.、Mm. You might look back and feel a greater sense of pride in getting a couple of A grades than you would about scraping through three or four other subjects. Yes, I see what you're saying. I hadn't thought about it like that before. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. I'm trying to help you see the possibilities. Yes, I see that. Do you think I should accept that there are one or two subjects I'll fail and just forget about them? Oh, I wouldn't want to give you that advice.、Mm. I think you should go into each of the exams at least hoping for a pass grade.、Mm -hmm. My advice would be to set a time limit on how long you'll spend on each subject. You may want to spend a little longer on the subjects you find most difficult, but not an excessive amount of time. Yes, thanks. That's helpful advice. Do you have any more tips about how to go about the actual studying? I mean, how can I keep focused? Well, what sort of learner do you think you are? What do you mean? Well, if you're a visual learner, you like seeing things. From what I know of you, I think you probably are a very visual learner. Ah,、huh. so what does that mean in terms of revising? You probably learn best with images or diagrams. You could try organising information into tables or flowcharts. Hmm. I do sometimes make mind maps. Good idea.、Huh. I think mind maps can really help you organise your thoughts. And another thing, have you thought about revising with other students? I didn't think that would be a good idea. I mean, if I can't concentrate by myself, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be able to concentrate when there's another person there to distract me. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-nine and thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-nine and thirty. Hmm, that probably isn't true. Another person might help you focus.、Mm. Lots of students get together with a friend, sometimes in groups, to revise. They usually work out some sort of structured procedure. Okay, I'll think about it. I guess with a friend you could test each other. I mean, revise for a while and then take it in turns to ask each other questions. Now you're thinking in the right direction. <laughs> you could also write short summaries or essay introductions, say, and then read and comment on each other's work.、Hmm. Both positive and critical comments coming from a peer can be very helpful. There are all sorts of collaborative strategies, and apart from anything else, having company is so much nicer than struggling through alone. <laughs> Okay, you've given me a lot to think about. Thanks for your time. I feel much more positive than I did. I'm really glad to hear that. Coming to see me in the first place was very sensible. <laughs> Do come back and tell me how things are going in a couple of weeks. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about animals. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about avoiding predation. What does that mean, I hear you say? Well, you probably know the word predator. I'm sure you've all seen Predator the movie. Well, a predator is any animal that hunts and kills another animal. That animal, and I was going to say that smaller animal, but it's not always the case, is the prey. An owl, for example, is a predator, and a mouse is its prey. A lion is a predator, and a much bigger animal, a buffalo, for example, is its prey. So when I say avoiding predation, what I mean is not being caught and eaten. For many small animals, not being caught and eaten is pretty much a full-time job. Many animals that are predators themselves may be the prey of another, usually bigger animal. This is what we popularly call the food chain. So, how do animals avoid predation? Well, they have what we call defense mechanisms. These are ways in which the species has adapted over time to give it an advantage over its predators. Any adaptation of this kind increases the species' chances of survival. Over time, species that have not adapted, that is, developed some sort of defense mechanism, have met with extinction. There are various forms of defense. The first is probably very obvious, and that's speed. Predators can't feed on what they can't catch. Running away is a very effective defense mechanism, as some of you can probably remember from primary school. Flight is even more effective. Species which have developed the ability to fly over time have an enormous advantage. Far more birds would be a meal out in the wild if they couldn't fly. The second mechanism is protective coloration. You might hear the word camouflage used too, but I personally find that too simple a term when it comes to the animal kingdom. Protective coloration includes a number of slightly varied mechanisms within the overall term. Some animals blend in with their background. A chameleon is a good example. It sits on a tree, and it looks like the branch of that tree. Butterflies have what we think of as beautiful patterns, not to be beautiful, but to confuse and warn off potential assailants. They blend in with the flowers around them, but may also look like something else. Some butterflies have patterns that look like huge eyes, and a would-be predator is scared off. There are all sorts of stories about how the zebra got its stripes, and not many people really know what the stripes are there for. Well, that type of coloration is called dazzle camouflage. A zebra stands out when alone and stationary, but when zebras move rapidly in a herd, their stripes create motion dazzle, a confusing, flickering mass to the eye of a lion or cheetah that might be giving chase. Selecting a target becomes far more difficult. Now, of course, animals are caught. They're frequently caught, but that might not mean the game's up. Some animals make themselves difficult or horrible to eat. Hedgehogs have sharp spines that deter a predator from tucking in even when it's captured its prey. The predator is very likely to give up when a spine gouges an eye or gets lodged in its throat. Numerous species of creature, turtles or snails, for example, have developed a tough outer shell that makes it almost impossible to devour. One of my favorite creatures is the skunk, which emits a repulsive smell on being cornered, enough to send any attacker herring back into the undergrowth. In a similar way, some sea-dwelling mollusks can emit an ink cloud that fills the surrounding water, concealing it from a predatory fish that may be circling. 
There are frogs that go one step further. They're so poisonous that even if a predator does try and eat them, it'll probably keel over and drop dead first. Now, you'll probably be surprised, but I'm going to go on to talk about plants. Yes, many plants have defense mechanisms in exactly the same way as animals. You've probably all been stung by a nettle at some time. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.